no, it was great. Uh, the weather was good. There wasn't a huge crowd, and uh, uh, it was, it was No, it's Labor Day. Sunday's the last day. And Sunday, it's reduced prices, and it's a STEM day. And I'm going because there's a guy that does a DNR birdhouse uh, project. Here he is. Holy cow. Just on time. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to Iowa City Community School Board meeting on uh, Tuesday, August 15th. My name is Chris Lynch. I call this meeting to order. I'd like to thank uh, those in the audience and those on TV for taking an interest in our district business. I'd like to start tonight by introducing it, those at the table with me tonight. To my right is Superintendent Steve Murley and Directors Lori Rotland, Phil Hemingway, Brian Kersling, Paul Ressler, Chris Liebig, and Recording Secretary Kim Colvin. The public is reminded if they wish to speak, they need to complete a speaker form found at the table in the lobby and turn it in during community comment. Persons may speak to the board about topics relevant to the district. All community comment directed at non-agenda and agenda items shall take place at the beginning of the meeting during the community comment section of the agenda. The first item on the agenda tonight is the ICA update. Uh, Brady and Mitch. Uh, hi, Brady Shunt from uh, ICEA, and I have what the dynamic duo tonight. Usually it's just me, so... Yeah, thanks for rescheduling your meeting so I get to, to come to one of these. Uh, obviously, we have Corville City Council on the normal nights when you guys have board meetings, so I'm not able to come, but uh, with the reschedule, uh, I'm here, so can't wait to see <laughs> what happens. We yeah. usually take too long. So uh, just a couple of things. You know, it's, I always say this time of school, uh, all the teachers are, are absolutely ready to go. We know students are probably even more excited and anxious uh, than, than we are to get back into classrooms and start to learn. Uh, just a shout out to our custodial staff. Um, Dwayne let the physical plan, the custodians know. The buildings are looking fantastic. They do an unbelievable amount of work. This time in particular, all of those things that are like the 100 item to-do list, they're really cranking through it. So our men and women who work in those areas, just you know, tremendous um, you know, effort and job by them. We really, really appreciate it. Because we can't do what we want to do in the classrooms unless they're working their butt off all summer, especially these last few weeks. Um, our second thing is we would like to publicly uh, announce, I know it's been in the papers, uh, our endorsement of the Go Bond on September 12th and of the One Community, One Bond efforts. Our uh, executive board and our building representative council voted unanimously in support of the September 12th vote and we are urging community <coughs> members to become informed and then we're urging community members to vote yes on that. Uh, we think that it supports uh, it makes a strong statement in support of public education in our schools across the district, making them more accessible, uh, making the learning environments a lot better. I've been 21 years in the district in a classroom without air conditioning with windows that leak when it rains or it snows. Uh, and so I definitely know personally that that is a challenging um, you know, work environment uh, to be in. So our students are going to benefit with the passage. We're proud to support it, and we will be active in that, in, in that regard from here on out. Uh, likewise, we'd like to announce two weeks from tonight, on August 29th, the ICEA will be hosting a school board uh, candidate forum along with the Press Citizen. That is from 6.30 to 8.30 at the Iowa City Library. Uh, it's a unique forum because uh, Brady and I and our membership will create some questions. The Press Citizen will create questions, but then we also do take questions from the audience. So it, it's a great chance uh, for the public to become uh, engaged. And I guess we'll end with, uh, Brady and I had the great pleasure of speaking uh, this morning to the new teachers of the district. And there are over 100 uh, new teachers that are uh, going to be calling Iowa City Community School District home. And uh, it, it's one of our favorite events of the year. And, and uh, kudos to uh, the hires because it's a great, great crop of young and old and veteran teachers uh, alike. Thank you. Thanks, Brady and Mitch. Next time on the agenda is uh, community comment. Thank you for your interest in the Iowa City Community School District and for your willingness to share your comments. You're reminded to give your name, address, and the topic you wish to speak during community comments. Persons may speak to the board about topics relevant to the district. All community comments directed at non-agenda and agenda items shall take place at the beginning of the meeting and shall be limited to four minutes per speaker. The initial community comment period shall be limited to one hour. Remaining community comment to the extent necessary shall take place at the end of the meeting. To the extent you're commenting on items not on our posted agenda, the board may ask follow-up questions of speakers, but is prohibited by Iowa Open Meeting Law from responding to questions from speakers or from engaging in substantive discussion regarding non-agenda items. First up tonight is uh, Rafael Montaigne, and then on deck will be uh, Don Sayak. Good afternoon. 
<clears throat> Hello, everybody. I'm Rafael Morataya, and I'm living 4419 East Coral Street. I have three kids at that district, and two are used to go to Longfellow. Now, those two are going to Hoover. In the last two weeks, I <clears throat> emailed you guys about the sidewalk and the safety of my kids and all around my neighborhood. I'm sorry to say, but it's a lame response for you guys and especially for those who respond to me and those for who ignore my email and my safety, is because, <clears throat> and did you mind? It's a plan from the city to build sidewalk. So by when it's gonna build the sidewalk? One year, two years, six months, right? You know, the, you know the answer, right? So I went this morning there to make sure before to come here today, and say maybe they, I'm wrong. I went there, nothing that happened. No sidewalk, no safety cross. The speed limit is still the same, 35, <clears throat> 35 miles per hour. Inside the campus, you know, when you pass the, the, the legion, it's true, 20 miles, I think, per hour, 20, 25. But the road is still 35. So, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know, but you know, I have spoken with some of you personally, and I <clears throat> do think that the school district has responsibility on this. You need to have you know, accountability, because you make the plan to build this school, not the city. If you need something from the city, you need to tell the city in advance, even the police. So I'm going today to the city, because I have to do for another for business, but then I wanna tell them not the same that I'm telling you right now, but to tell them that they have to work with the city as soon as they can, because, so, you know, it's a nice response, right? So send the ball there like a ping pong, right? Like you call to the customer service, you don't have response. So the same thing, I, I think that you guys are disconnected with our kids, to be honest. You know, I don't see any solution, just tell them to go to the city and then complain with the city and then this, the site was gonna be built by the city, everything in the city, it's not. You made the plan for the city, for this school two or three years ago. You also have the accountability in this. You make the plans, not the kids, not the principal from Longfellow, not the PTA, nobody else. So you have the whole, whole responsibility and you have to fix this problem. So now you are waiting for the police to send officer there so basically they have to, I don't know if they're gonna spend more money, if they're gonna pay overtime, I don't know about the, where the money come from. But now they have to send officers there morning and the afternoon to provide safe, safety to our kids, to cross in that. So <clears throat> I hope this um, take in consideration for you guys and you know, and um, um, you know, uh, this morning I, I emailed Phil and you know, Phil, um, being really <clears throat> respond to me about this, and I appreciate your support. And then, you know, as you know, Superintendent, you know, um, um, I'm really um, looking forward to meet, but I to work in this issue, but I don't think that, that the school district has any intention to move quickly in this. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Raphael. Don? On deck will be Kathy Durbin. I'm Don Zacek. I live at 1930 Robin Drive in North Liberty. I am also the school counselor at Penn Elementary. Um, some of you may have seen me before. Um, because of the no votes that happened last month during a school board meeting um, when the construction at Penn was on the consent agenda, um, several of us at Penn thought it was a really good idea to come and address with you the importance of making sure that project really does get finished and then it does get done well. Um, and I know it wasn't part of the FMP, right? That, that wasn't part of the facilities master plan. But this is the school, um, third school year that our new addition has been in use. And that addition was a really good thing for Penn because we were crowded, we needed it. Um, so that addition relieved the crowding. However, the year we opened the addition, three days before school started, we were allotted three FTE, full-time FTE. And because we started a preschool program that year as well, that filled all of our classrooms. 
in a $9 million edition. So we were crowded again. Um, and again, <laughs> great, we needed the FTE to relieve the numbers, um, but it filled our building. So we were back to using temporary classrooms for traveling music. We were back to using a temporary classroom for our ELP. Um, and that was exactly what the district didn't want to do. That's why we worked on building that addition. You didn't want us in temporaries, but that's where we ended up. We also had to move the Family Resource Center that year um, to where band and orchestra were supposed to be located because then with changing classrooms, we had no place for our Family Resource Center. So then band and orchestra got relocated to what was supposed to be a storage closet. And that had to be redone for band and orchestra. So now we're at a crossroads again and we're out of space and we need space. Um, a fourth second grade section was needed for this coming school year in order to manage those numbers on that grade level. We're adding an ELL program this year. Um, we're adding a half-time level one special education teacher this year. And we were just allotted yesterday another FTE, right? So you can see that we're out of, we're growing, we're huge. Um, last numbers I looked at were 670 something if you include our 40 preschoolers. And because preschool has such, um, legalities with it about how much space they have to have, we're limited at where we can put preschool, right? So um, the unfortunate thing is here we are a week before school starts, before students come, and we're still doing this. So some of us don't have office spaces, some of us still don't have classrooms to teach in. Um, and we have these 600 and some students that are coming. The issue is they're here. <laughs> they're not going anywhere, they belong in our building. They're in our attendance area. We have to have some place for them to be. We can't put 40 kids in a classroom. It doesn't work. So we have to have space. So if we aren't finishing this and we aren't doing it well, where are teachers going to teach and where are kids going to learn? Because it can't be in hallways and it can't be in classrooms with 40 kids. So it's imperative that we have these rooms finished that have already been started so that kids can learn and teachers can teach and we can do all of our jobs to the best of our ability and the kids can achieve. Um, and as the school counselor, I don't have a place yet because it's not done. So imagine where are kids going <laughs> if those rooms aren't finished for them and where are teachers teaching. Um, so we don't want to be back in temps. We've already lost a temp to another building. We just want the spaces, make sure they're finished and finished well so that everyone can have the best school year possible. Thanks. Thanks, Don. Kathy? And that could be Rick Dobbins. Hello. I am Kathy Durbin, and I live at 365 South Stewart Street, North Liberty. I am a district parent and also a fourth grade teacher at Penn. So I wanted to come here tonight to say thank you to the board members who did vote last month for the yes, um, for the um, to fund the construction that's needed for the Penn classrooms. I appreciate that. I did email the remaining members who voted no. Um, Chris Leibig, um, thank you for your email response. I do appreciate that. However, it didn't really solve our problem, so I'm hoping that we can still get that resolved. And Lori, I appreciate your email response and the phone call. Um, the communication was key. And for me, for teachers' voices to be heard, that's really important, so thank you for the phone call. And Mr. Hemingway, I have yet to hear back from you, so perhaps I will in the future. Um, so I'm here in solidarity, in solidarity with Dawn and the other Penn teachers who are directly affected by this delay in the construction. Last spring when Christy Hefner, Penn principal, uh, announced to the staff the increased enrollment and addition of English language learners classroom, I was concerned about where we would teach um, the children since we were already overflowing into the temporaries, even with our new addition. Unexpectedly, Christy told us of a plan that administration had come up with to create classrooms for all those students. So I was excited and I was hopeful and I expressed that to Lori on the, in the phone call. And I thought to myself that the district is actually going to do it this time. You're going to step up and make sure that we have space for all of our students when they come into the classrooms in August. Well, that's not gonna happen. And I'm not surprised, quite frankly, and I'm disappointed. Um, so, 
I am disappointed despite you not knowing about the construction. Um, I really would have appreciated six yes votes last month for the construction and then to kind of backpedal to figure out how to fund it. Anyway, um, so as I understand it, the construction continues at a slow uh, but scaled down pace and the classrooms will not be 100% ready for the students and teachers next week, August 23rd. I don't think the board truly understands the crowding issues that we have at Penn. Um, even with the new addition and new walls that will create classrooms for the new classes this fall. So I sincerely um, and genuinely invite you to pen this fall. Uh, please visit the lunchroom, the old gym, and the commons. The lunchroom is too small for a population of students. The old gym will be two classrooms, so PE classes will be, dis be displaced. The commons will also be classrooms, so there will be no space for students to take breaks, to work with support staff and volunteers, There'll be no space for small independent groups of students to work on projects, for grade levels to gather to watch a movie, or for grade level teachers to gather to work on curriculum projects and lesson plans. We will have no space for invited guests to teach, dance, or hold interactive science demonstrations. There will be no space for after school volunteers um, for those after school clubs that uh, the kids really enjoy. What we've gained from the, the new addition has already been lost by our increase in population. Yes, we absolutely need the new walls to be funded and finished in a timely manner, but the space issue doesn't end there. It will need to be addressed each year as the population of students continues to grow. I ask you to keep that in mind as you make plans for the new elementary school in North Liberty, and, or the North Liberty area. It will be... Um, that school will also need the space, space that I mentioned above, as well as Penn needing those spaces back, or more spaces, um, if we keep those classrooms. So we have fun spaces to learn, and spaces for, oh, my time's up. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Anyway, Thanks, thank Kathy. you. Rick? Good evening, everybody. I'm Rick Dobbins. I live in the city of Iowa City, and uh, applicable to this group, I am a graduated uh, parent of Ernest Horn Elementary, Northwest Junior High, and West High School. I'm also a graduate of the Iowa City Council, and as part of that group, um, several years ago, I was one of two members of our council that attended the uh, working groups um, that went over the current um, facilities master plan. And I went to a lot of meetings over many hours in many places, and I was deluged by a lot of paperwork, <laughs> thank you, Steve, um, that uh, we all looked at. And I think probably one thing that was sort of unusual for me was that I was one of few people in the room that got exactly what I wanted. What I wanted is having really no dog in the fight anymore as my daughters have graduated from the district is that I wanted to see democracy. I wanted to see raw, unbridled, participatory democracy. And yeah, it was pretty raw. Um, I would sit at tables, and if you could even come to that meeting after studying all the homework um, that was provided by the district, and if you could reconcile within yourself what you thought was the best plan. I mean, imagine you're sitting at a table of five or six people, um, many of whom you know because we know it's a really small town. And you have to reconcile with all of them sort of what's going on. And all of them have dogs in the fight. It's very intense. And you're sitting at a table and you're talking with people about things that mean so much to them because they have kids that are currently in the school district. And those of you who are there participated in that felt that. And then, as if that wasn't cruel enough, then we had to break into groups and each table had to sort of defend their position. And incrementally and sequ uh, sequentially, we had to come up with a consensus opinion. That is democracy. It's almost as raw as a Quaker meeting because it keeps going until you get to something that we can all look at. So at the end of the meeting, what happened? Well, I walked out reasonably happy because it was the end of the meeting, and I got what I wanted. And I'm not sure everybody else got what they wanted because everybody had to give up something. That is the nature of that type of interaction. And when they left, everybody had to make a decision. 
do I join this effort going forward? Or for those who didn't get what they wanted, go on and sit there and decide, is this something that I need to, within myself, fight as we go along, as it goes forward? I'm here to suggest, since I got what I wanted, that we all got what we wanted and we should have is that I would support the general obligation bond um, because I think if it doesn't go forward, then those of you who remain on this board, those of them who are sitting here and elsewhere who may be elected to the board in the future, are basically in for several years of catfight. A catfight that I know pretty well because, well, I've walked the walk. I've been on a council and I've had to represent people of differing opinions. And I know the politics of this area more than most, and it's going to be difficult. It's going to be bad. For that reason, and so many others that have been articulated, I want to hope that everybody votes, everybody votes yes for the general obligation bond for those and for so many other reasons. And in particular, as someone who is a graduate of an elected position, I want to thank Chris, Chris and Brian, for your service. I want to reintroduce you to the loveliness of a free Tuesday night at home. Thank, thanks, Rick. <laughs> that sounds great. I know it's only a theoretical dream, and I want to thank you for your service. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. All right, next item on the agenda is our business uh, consent agenda. I move that we approve the business consent agenda as presented. I'd like to pull a couple of things here. There's a motion on the table. Trouble getting into my uh, computer. Is there a second? And two. I'll second it. Discussion? Well, I'd, I would like uh, a discussion on some items on the agenda 12 and 16, 17, and 18. So 12 was West High task yep. courts. And 16, uh, 16 17, 17, and 18, and 18 could be all grouped together. Can you tell oh, me what 16, 17, and 18 are? The still yeah. Oh, the sure, Chris. Uh, it's the, uh, those are the maintenance buildings. There's a change order there. And on 12, um, there's some information on the uh, tennis courts that I talked with Mitch before the meeting I would like to share with the public. I'd like to pull number five and number 15. Laura, did you have he said it. same numbers? All right. Phil, how are the bills? Yes. Um, uh, I went through, uh, there was a, a couple of. Can I interrupt? Do we need to approve the rest of the consent agenda? Well, there's a motion items? on the table to approve the whole thing, so we need to finish that process. Okay. And then I, I think we got it noted which ones. Yeah, I, I, I went through, looked at the bills. There was one uh, uh, clerical error on a uh, vehicle repair that was put into a different account, but that was corrected and everything else seems in order. And I review them as well. They look good, so I review them as well. Okay. All right, for the discussion, Kim, ready to vote on the motion on the table? Online voting is open. Um, and this is to. This is to approve the whole thing. Excuse me. It's to approve the whole thing. Oh, the whole thing without anything yes. pulled. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was the motion made. So. All votes have been cast, and the motion fails. With directors Liebig, Hemingway, and Rutland voting nay, and directors Kersling, Lynch, and Ressler voting yay. Entertain a motion to approve consent minus 5, 12, 15, 16, 17, and 18. So moved. Is there a second? Second. For the discussion. Kim, ready to vote? You're not able to get on at all, Chris? Or uh, it's just not letting me in. I'm trying to get it up on the phone. 
so I can Bill, were you the second? That. Excuse me? Were you the second? Paul was second. Paul was. Okay, yeah. thank you. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thanks, Kim. Next item on the agenda is director liaisons. This is an information only topic, so the information's in the packet. And the next item going into teaching and learning is the annual climate survey results, Steve. I'm going to have uh, Kristen pull up the main report. Uh, this is uh, the fourth year that we've done the survey, and I know that uh, uh, you like three slides. So uh, if you pull up the 1617 uh, district climate survey report, uh, if you're looking for size, it says 891 kilobytes next to it. Uh, just draw your attention to uh, slide four in there, uh, which is our participation rate, uh, just so you know who's uh, participating in it. Uh, Kristen, if you'd scroll down to slide five, uh, this is the uh, historical uh, trend line for uh, uh, people who uh, rate the school either an A or a B, uh, if you look at the green and the blue. Uh, and then if you would scroll down to slide 17, one of the things we ask folks, if you look at the bottom of that one, is whether or not they enjoy working for the district. Uh, and I just draw attention to the fact that uh, we've been consistently over 90% for the last four years. So, uh, again, this is a, a survey that uh, we administer uh, annually, uh, and uh, we've worked with the ICEA to make sure that uh, our employees have a high level of comfort knowing that uh, it's administered by a third party uh, and that uh, what we get are aggregated results, and we just uh, share those with you each year. And so uh, we'd be more than happy to answer questions. All right, discussion. So first, it seems like it was, there's very broad-based improvement, right? It's continual improvement over four years. Yes. And it was in almost all the areas, and it was at the district level, the school level. Yes, and, and maybe I should have made note of the fact that uh, we drill down to the building level, uh, and so now that you've seen that as a board team, uh, we will push that out to each of the buildings. Uh, we ask them to share that with their staff annually uh, so that they can take a look at uh, how their parents I uh, um, view them, uh, how they uh, see themselves in terms of the relationship with their parents and uh, their students and uh, where there are opportunities for us to improve each year. And based on the participation, what's the significance or what's the probability of significance? Uh, from a statistical standpoint, uh, you look at about a 95% uh, confidence interval with it. So pretty high confidence. Mm -hmm. I just want to say congratulations to administration at the district level, at the school level, and then also congratulations to the ICA and SEIU okay. and everybody's involved because we've been working, you know, culture and climate with very collaboratively with our unions and the total organization and show some good results. So there's obviously still work to be done, but um, looks very promising. So, Can you repeat what you just said about a 95% confidence level? Uh, with a 40% response, there's a... Well, I'd be more than happy Unless to... Unless it's a randomized response rate. If it's self-selected, you don't have any confidence whatsoever that it reflects the full population. I, and I'm not a survey expert, so if you'd like well, me to push that out, I'd don't be, mean to be happy the, to. I'm always the wet blanket when it comes to statistical stuff, but that is not a... You, know, you can't even talk about a margin of error when, when it's not a randomized survey. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm sure a lot of things in the district are good. Some things maybe need some work, some things may be improving, uh, but I think every time we, we have these discussions and we insist on putting the happiest possible face on these things based on 38% non-random response, uh, it's just not careful use of data and it comes off as, as advertising and, and you lose credibility. Uh, I think we should be more careful with uh, the conclusions that we draw from a really, you know, a data that, that doesn't really justify broad conclusions. It's nice, a lot of it's nice. We don't really know if it reflects the larger population that didn't take the survey. I just find your interesting your comments interesting, Chris, because we're fine sharing all the negative data when we disaggregate data and we, we just share the data. Well, when we have scores, test score data, we're talking about 100% of the kids getting tested. That's a different story. There's other surveys that don't include 100%. But well, when those I, happen, is usually when I speak up I, and say you've got to be careful with what, you, what conclusions you draw from a non-random survey. I hear you. Or positive data, right? Either way, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the discussion. Sure, I'd just make one note. If you look up above there, you see that uh, 
One of the things that uh, we know we struggle with over time is professional development in the district. So uh, based on uh, what we saw here, uh, uh, we actually went out and did another professional development survey and uh, we just concluded a Google Summit which had many staff-led sessions and we'll have a, a TQ professional development day on Thursday where we've got 55 uh, sessions led by staff members in the district and part of that's in response to that follow-up survey we did so we can better understand why two-thirds of the uh, people find uh, our professional development satisfactory, but we've got a third of the folks that aren't getting the value out of it that uh, we think they should, given the time, energy, and effort that we spend on it. So uh, we do recognize there are areas of opportunity for us, and we're trying to use that information uh, to get better as a district. Well, and actually, when, when I was reviewing the data and, we, and came across the professional development um, question, that did stick out. But um, when I go back to the two times we've been through leadership for student learning, there's a whole chapter on how the professional development has to align with the strategic plan, and the strategic plan is just being implemented. So I hope that we see um, value gained by having a clear direction with the professional development um, so that going forward, you know, those numbers will start to climb as well. I think, this is, I think the numbers in, in every category are, are impressive. Um, uh, you know, this is the fourth year of receiving this report, and um, uh, I, I, uh, I appreciate seeing improvement and positive gains. I did enjoy the, uh, the question about the number of hours in the curriculum day, uh, the teachers uh, approving of where the bell schedule is right now, because um, you know, there's a lot of work was put into that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, based on academic research and best learning for adolescents and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, that, that's good to see that. Anyhow, you know, in summary, I just say that uh, Again, I, I enjoy seeing um, positive gains from hard work and, um, you know, four years in a row uh, seeing the survey, it's, it's whether or not it's uh, randomized, um, you know, the people that answer it are seeing an improvement overall. So thank you. I have just a couple comments. Um, so I'm going to piggyback on the start and end times, um, the, the bell schedule. As uh, several of us know, um, there was a lot of effort put into that. Uh, many teachers and um, staff people in the district put a lot of effort into that um, discussion, and we had a unanimous vote here. And um, I, I'm really pleased to see that the teachers um, seem to be at least the ones that responded seem to be, um, this reflects that they also concurs that. I, I feel like our process was one that was respectful and inclusive of the teachers in that result. Um, so that's, I feel good about that. Um, the one other thing I wanted to bring up is um, in the area of equity. Um, I notice that there's a perception difference between um, our staff person's perception of fairness of discipline and um, whether there's uh, negative things being stated about race or sexual orientation. Um, in all of those areas, there's a quite significant perception difference between this, the respondents of this survey and the um, much uh, the, the response that the students gave us that was um, more of a scientific approach in terms of respondents. Um, so I'm just wondering how, um, what, what you would like to add to that. And sure. Uh, so Kingsley's not here, but uh, we had a chance to take a look at that and uh, to identify what we see as a gap uh, in, as you said, uh, perceptions. Uh, and so as we move forward with our work uh, on equity, uh, whether it's uh, working with implicit bias training or looking at these gaps, uh, it creates for us that uh, uh, genesis for what's next for professional development. Uh, for our team. So again, you don't see the building level results on here, but then the other opportunity that we have uh, is to look at the building level results of this data and the building level results from the student data to identify if there are specific buildings where that gap is more pronounced than others. Uh, and uh, as Kingsley would tell you, that's our opportunity to look at uh, those uh, schools where we might first uh, address professional development in those areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, for the discussion. Thanks, Steve. Kristen, next item on the agenda is uh, drinking water, the lead testing. Steve. I'm going to turn that over to Dwayne if I get my mic on here. Dwayne, if you'd like to share that with us. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Not really a lot to add, but just wanted to update you. The last time we spoke, we, had, we identified issues at uh, Southeast Junior High and Trek. Uh, at Southeast Junior High, we've since gone out and put in new uh, a water 
the fountain. We also put a filter on it, retested it, and it came back negative. So we think we solved that problem. At Trek, uh, we identified the real problem at Trek was the water didn't move, not enough water moved through the lines. It just kind of sat there. Uh, the chlorine dissipated, and that actually became an issue as well, probably a bigger issue than the lead. Uh, so we devised a system whereby every few hours we we dump a few gallons of water into the sewer system. It's a sad thing to say, but that keeps the fresh water moving in the pipes. There's just not enough use there. Uh, we think it's going to work. We just went out and retested. Don't have that result yet, but we're confident that that problem has been resolved too. So that had to answer any questions you might have. And just to clarify, Southeast was under the action limit, but you still took action and sounds like a good result. And just to note that testing negative means there's nothing present that's dangerous for students. Right. Not oh, great. Thanks, Dwayne. Yep. All right. Next time on the agenda is the quarterly financial review, Craig. Leslie? I'll let Leslie uh, this is a uh, quarterly report through June 30th. It uh, uh, represents uh, transactions on a cash basis. Uh, accrual basis entries are in the process now. The audit process will start on the 28th, I believe, is the date uh, that they start for a couple weeks that they're here. You'll get their report in late October, uh, and then the final report, uh, the first meeting in December. Um, I will bring your attention to the unspent balance projections. Um, our expenditures came in at 99.94% of what we had projected on the March 31st report. Um, Craig and I think that's a pretty good um, estimation, but again, the accrual numbers are likely to, to come in a little bit different because of all the transactions and activity to gear up for Liberty and, and Hoover East and, and that type of thing and some summer school that uh, you don't know exactly how many hours are going to be in some of those areas uh, in March. So. Well, you stole my thunder, Les. I always jump to I always jump to the unspent balance. So I guess I'll just start since you since you end up there. But uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, so when Brian and I started, uh, that was declining at 1.8 percent a year, and we were within 12 to 18 months of going negative, which is basically illegal or not allowed or you know. Um, and of course, we devised a plan at that time through a series of tough decisions. But even then, I'm, we weren't sure if we'd get back to 5 percent. So. The fact that we were able to get back to 6.2% is, you know, amazing and um, it's very important as we're opening some of the new facilities and um, I just want to see, I agree, you know, the, the school board policy is to keep it in 5 to 10%, um, but I just want to say I'm aligned going forward to keeping it just slightly above 5 and um, we're just in a good, good, good position because all the work we've done and again, we need the facilities master plan to keep coming to drive some of the operational savings that are, you've, uh, you've modeled here, but um, that's just an amazing turnaround in, I guess, three and a little bit years. So, uh, congratulations. Uh, am I, I just want to make sure that I'm reading this right. First off, thank you for presenting it in a very digestible format. I say that all the time. This is my last opportunity to say that. It is great. Uh, I love the, the heat map one showing comparable districts plus three and minus three as far as the rankings go. I just want to make sure that and, uh, the level of efficiency that we have across all areas is, is impressive. I know that we've increased, that we've dropped a little bit in the support staff per student rank, um, but I suspect that some of that has to do with weighted resource allocation, I'm guessing. Okay, that's, so that's anticipated, right? Um, the, the one thing that, that stuck out to me is one little number in the middle of page four, and, and please correct me if I'm reading this wrong, but we're 177th out of 336 districts as far as tax rate. Mm -hmm. So we're right in the middle. Right in the middle. That's great to know. Yep. Because there's a lot of insinuations that our tax rate is off the charts compared to other school districts. So we're the fifth largest, soon to be fourth, and our tax rate is right in the middle of the pack. Yes. Thank you. All right, for the discussion. Yeah, All right. I have, I have a few comments. Yeah. And, and I'm just going to say, Brian, um, I don't want to get in for a t for tab, but our valuation is number two in the state. Fully so, aware. So we, we have very high val valuation, which is a good situation. Good situation. But we mm -hmm. do have taxes that reflect our valuation um, with a lower tax rate. Um, so uh, a few things I'd like to highlight. Um, I have lots of questions, so I'll try to keep it just to my few that are most important. Um, so on page nine, 
Um, there, um, I suspect I know what answer you'll give me, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, on the first um, line there where numbers are listed, which is regular instruction, um, the, uh, I assume these are year-end numbers, um, that we've only used 95% of the um, budgeted amount for regular instruction. Um, are, are there expenses that are outstanding that, yet that we haven't paid that will bring that closer to 100? Uh, some of those areas are um, because of carryovers in certain areas. For example, uh, the teacher leadership program. If you recall, this is only the second year of that program, and so we underspent the first year somewhat intentionally as we were getting into that, and now um, Mark Brockmeyer has led us through that process such that we will spend down those amounts, but that includes opening liberty that needs more people to provide those things. So some of those things are built in there, um, and we will approach 100% with some of those areas as we spend those down in category. Okay, I just want to make sure because that's $3.5 million, and if we say a teacher costs $80,000, that's uh, 44 teachers. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that mm -hmm. we don't right. underspend in the area where right. we potentially could have mm -hmm. a lot of impact and um, in a lot of ways in the district. Um, so going to um, the same sort of topic on page 11, um, when we're talking about our teacher-pupil uh, ratio, I'm glad to see it's falling ever so slightly um, to, I think it's 14.4, perhaps. Um, nice to see that movement. However, we are still quite a bit higher than the state median. Um, is, are there things that we can do to get smaller class sizes so that we can, I, I know this is like a broken record, but... Um, to try and get closer to that state median uh, pupil? Some of these numbers um, are, you got to consider what you're comparing with other districts. I know, it's not. Where we, office, for example, but. at the elementary level, where we have a media specialist and a guidance counselor in virtually every elementary building. That's not something you see in smaller districts. And so that inc changes the ratio. So it's not a true apples to apples because not everybody's staffing in the same way. So on average, 330 districts, it's that 14 number. So you got to take the, the big, the small, and the good and the bad with, with those comparisons. So I see what you're saying, Lori, and, and it makes sense. Um, and we are going in the right direction. Just out of curiosity, could we, uh, just like we do the plus 5, minus 5, could we look at the plus 5, minus 5 in size? Because I think there's some economies yeah. of scale that the larger districts get, which I mm -hmm. think puts us out of whack with some of the really small districts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think that might be a really useful comparison for us moving forward so we can see how we benchmark against other like type districts. Yeah, that would be helpful. And the board already has, you know, that method in place with the uh, weighted resource allocation model or where we're uh, trying to lower class sizes when it's um, when we have the resources and the space to do so. And uh, so I, I believe you already have your policies and, and procedures in place. We're carrying those out. We've, uh, uh, we've added a lot of teachers again this year as space and resources allow. And so we keep nibbling away at that. Um, but um, um, you're right, you, you know, the, the numbers uh, speak for themselves and, and we have more work to do. Okay, great, thank you. Um, then. On page 10, on line 46, um, it lists some um, FMP costs that are going to come out of the general fund. Um, one of them is for staffing and programming. That's about a million dollars. One of them's supply costs for 300000 It's in fiscal year 2018. So um, I know we're talking future, oh. but I just was wondering, um, can you tell me more about why those are general fund costs? Well, um, under the definition of the school funding, for instance, uh, you can't pay for a supply item out of SAVE or PEPL. It has to be an, an equipment item in excess of uh, $500. And so there's a lot of those things that we buy for the classroom environment that simply have to be a general fund expenditure. And uh, so we uh, budgeted for that uh, several years ago as we've been planning uh, for this event uh, to open up uh, Liberty High School and we've had that in there uh, for the last couple of years uh, just to recognize that that'll be a cost and um, 
a couple of years ago, or well, it's been more than that, it's been about five years ago, the SBRC uh, allowed us to go back to them for those supply items, but they've cut that off now. <laughs> and so that'll be just a true expenditure out of our general fund, and, and uh, that's, just some, that's just the cost of doing business of opening up a new school for us. So, okay. Yeah, yeah it's, it, I know that I'm speaking to the choir, but anything we can pay for not out of the general fund that has to do with mm -hmm. facilities, we always obviously want to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and um, then, just can I follow quickly up, yeah. quickly up on that? The uh, what's the staffing component of that that would only be for that one year? Well, the SBRC, the School Budget Review Committee, uh, does allow us to uh, uh, go and uh, um, ask for the allowable growth. They don't give us any money. They require us to fund that them ourselves through cash reserve, which I talked to you about when we passed our budget why we're asking for the additional cash reserve this year so that that money would flow in uh, to our bank account to pay for any SBRC decisions this coming year. This is one of those decisions, but they allow us to go to them for uh, the first year staffing costs for opening up a new building. Now those are just the additional costs of opening up the building. For instance, um, you have to put on a new principal and a, and a, and a building secretary, and uh, you'll have uh, a new guidance counselor over there, and, and the list goes on and on. Plus, you'll have a series of new teachers. We can't ask for the transfer costs of teachers we're taking from West and City and putting in Liberty, um, because those are already costs that we have in place and are our funding, but new costs for staff we can go and ask for that. And our plan is to do that next March at the March SBRC meeting. Uh, once we have all of these costs known and uh, uh, quantified, and we can go to them and, and make that uh, request. But it's row, row 36, right? Do what? Row 36. Yes. I think I sort of understand, 70% understand. But so those expenses, of course, will continue beyond that year, but they just won't be in that category anymore? Those expenses continue beyond the year, but we own them the following year. Okay. So That's it's 1.6 million, right? But this is a one-time yeah, allow right. allowable growth. It will be listed elsewhere in the following years. All right. And my, my last two things are things I've said before. You've heard them from me. Um, I remain concerned about our net loss of students out of the district. Um, I, I looked, you know, if you look at that graph, um, we were holding pretty steady with our um, student um, enrollment out until uh, 2009, and then it started to greatly increase, and it's now basically doubled since 2009. So um, I know I've said that before, but uh, we want to make sure we're not losing students. So, um, you know, I, and, and I know I always say, what, you know, are we looking at that? And you always say yes. Um, so, you know, I think class size is an issue that we've talked about, and um, so, you know, anything we can continue to do to work on that um, so we don't have to spend um, our money uh, paying for students to go elsewhere. And then also broken record, um, transportation costs. I remain disappointed that we, um, even though we're busing less, fewer uh, North Liberty kids um, to uh, secondary schools with uh, the opening of Liberty, yet we still have a decrease, I mean, I'm sorry, an increase in our busing cost. Um, and this is after we've um, cut discretionary busing at the elementary level and after we saved a lot of money with our bell schedule change. So these are things I've said before. I, you know, I, I just remain disappointed that we couldn't have more of a cost. Well, it, I wish we wouldn't have had any cost increase and we would have actually seen a net decrease. Um, so, all right, I'll let well, you be. Thanks. Just to follow up a couple comments on your first comment. Um, I too am concerned about students going out. That's a tuition cost that you know uh, we account for. Um, one of the things that I, I know uh, to be true when, when I got here is that um, we were really pinched on space and so we, we were really close to open enrollment in um, because of, of that uh, in our secondary buildings and so forth. Um, with the opening up of Liberty and so forth, the board has had these discussions that maybe you know, that's an opportunity where uh, we don't have to be so uh, 
uh, closed to open enrollment uh, in for students anymore. And so um, a lot of those things were driven by those board policies that were in place and, and hopefully uh, with the facility master plan, if it moves forward, uh, creating more space that'll create more opportunities for our, our kids to stay here instead of go somewhere else. Um, as you know, and, and, and then as far as transportation is concerned, it's a two-edged sword and, and uh, uh, I too am disappointed, uh, but I understand why. And, and when we opened up Liberty High School, we create a, a, a whole new circle <laughs> of three miles where um, the parents are required under Iowa law to, to bring their children to school and, and we're not required to do that busing. Well, by taking out all of those secondary routes, and we talked about this when I gave the report the last time, um, it, it, we had been having the luxury or the efficiency of pairing secondary routes with elementary routes because of our bell schedule. Now we're not able to do that because the secondary routes don't exist anymore. And so we still have the cost for the route on the elementary and uh, that keeps our cost up, but we're not able to, uh, uh, to have that, that pairing. Savings, yeah. And so it makes us less efficient. It, it really does. We were really, really efficient before with, the, with both of those routes going, and, and now we're just less def efficient. I understand why, but I, but I too am disappointed, the same as you, that we couldn't have saved more. But um, it's, uh, it, let's get through this year. Let's shake it out. Let's see you know, how it all, all works, and, and maybe there's some opportunities uh, there uh, to explore as we move forward. Great, thank and you. Maybe one other quick note on it too. One of the things that we know is just an inherent inefficiency for the next couple of years is busing students out to New Hoover. Uh, and so once we return those students to their home attendance areas, we anticipate we'll be able to save two to three routes right there. So that'll be an, uh, a benefit for us from a financial standpoint. So that's a short term burden that we have, but we know that'll go away. Yeah. Thank discussion? you. I, I'd just like to cycle back to one thing. I know, Laura, you said you don't want to go tit for tat. I just want to point out that the valuation is high thing is absolutely true. It's something that Tuat used to say all the time. And the reason, for having four years worked with the assessors for both Johnson County and Iowa City, I will tell you that our assessors are spot on in their valuation, spot on in their assessments when it comes to sales of properties here. We have the two best ranked assessors in the entire state of Iowa here. The reason our valuation is high is because we have a great quality of life. It's a good place to live, and a huge part of that is the quality of the schools and the teachers that are here. So it's not a bad thing no, to have high thing, valuation. No. It's a good thing to have a high valuation. But you're right. The tax impact is higher even if the tax rate is lower. I get that. But I just wanted to circle back to that. That's a, it's a good thing yeah. to have a high valuation. Yeah, I 100% I agree. We, we absolutely want to have a high valuation. That's a, that's a great thing for our community. Um, I just wanted to point out that how that impacts the actual tax bill. Yep. So. Although it would be nice to have some more affordable housing. What's that? It would be nice to have some more affordable housing. Oh, this is true. <laughs> All right, further discussion? All right, next item on the agenda is PENX 9, Duane. Thank you. We have two uh, action items this evening. The first one is... Uh, as you know, we moved, we moved the 10 plex to Southeast Junior High, and as part of that project, the city uh, inspectors have required us to add a, a fire hydrant. That's our presentation. A fire hydrant, uh, some valves, and revised some water lines, and that created a, a change order of $6,504 for that project. Uh, the second one is we're excited to show you some uh, schematic designs for Lincoln Elementary School, and I'll preface it while they're getting set up here. Uh, it's not what you think. <laughs> we talked for years about adding onto the north side of that building. And what you need to know is that we considered four different options and variations of those four options. So probably three or four variations of each one of those. The site team is really uh, very active. They did a nice job. And we'll have, we'll have Dave uh, and Sarah from Design Lines show you the project in just a second, but I thought we'd start with uh, Ann. Langenfeld, the, the principal, and she's going to tell you a little bit about the process itself. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you and share these really creative plans with you. Um, last spring, we started the process of kind of figuring out what we wanted in possible renovations, knowing we needed to think outside the box because of our layout of our property. 
So using a cross-section of staff, specialist teachers, classroom teachers, um, office staff, we met together um, with the Design Alliance. We went through a big brainstorming process, thinking about functionality, what we wanted for safety and accessibility, problems that we currently had, and went through a whole series of brainstorming and talking about that. And then we eliminated and, and what kind of came at the top. And so as a result, Design Alliance went and brought back four different plans. And then we went through all of them thinking about our community because Lincoln is actually, it's a neighborhood hub. And our playground is more than just a playground for the school. It's a neighborhood park that's utilized seven days a week. So we wanted to make sure that our plan maintained that space and even added to it. Um, so that was number one for us, to make sure we had that and that it was accessible. So um, we're really excited to share these plans. I have two of the staff members, two of our teachers are here tonight <coughs> also that worked really hard at Yukiko Hill and Jenny Pine were part of that and they're here tonight too. So, hello. Uh, well, before you jump in there, what you need to visualize is the east side of that building. It's basically a goat hill. We just had the goats there, by the way, <laughs> cleaned it up. But in our wildest dreams, never thought we would be looking at that side of the building. So just keep that in mind when you look at the video, you're looking at the other side of the school, not what you think the front to be, okay? So Dave, I'll turn it over to you and Sarah. This is Dave Harrison and Sarah Houston with Design Alliance. We're very pleased to be here. Uh, I have a lot of gray hair and over the years I've developed what I think is an ability to sort of see what the project might be when we start. And this project is totally different than how I thought it would start uh, at the beginning. So let's go through a little bit of it here. Uh, your existing building was first built in 1926 and it's had numerous additions since that time, which makes it very difficult to, to add on. I'm sure each one of those additions made sense, but at some point the whole thing really doesn't make sense anymore. So that's what we, that's what we started with. Um, go ahead. Here's uh, some images of, of the existing building. Very crowded, tight conditions we feel. Uh, the upper left is the main entrance, which you'll see uh, in some of the later images and some small classrooms. The, the bathrooms, that center core of bathrooms in the older building is, is very congested and poorly organized from uh, the way that bathrooms need to work today. Go ahead, the next one. Uh, the existing gymnasium is on the upper left and it's, it's also very congested, very tight. Uh, the access to it is very difficult. It's, it's down about 10 feet from uh, the main level of the school. The access for food service is very poor. Uh, it's not big enough to, to serve uh, the community very well. There are several uh, mobiles on the site. The lower left you can see, the upper right. Uh, you can see that uh, constrict some of the playground area. And Dwayne talked about the goat hill. That's the lower right image there. There's a very large part of your site that your district owns that's very, very underutilized for this very uh, congested situation. We, uh, as a principal and discussed, we went through a process of evaluating the basic programming in the building and looked at different options. And we won't get into a lot of this because once we did this, we quickly went into looking at different options and comparing those for the actual functionality of the school. This is the uh, site plan that we're proposing. And I don't know what the best one to point at is here, but this one up here okay uh, so this is the existing building down across here is teeter court the main the main street that accesses it so the main building access right now is right here the main the main entrance you can see that the district owns this part of the site which is over on the east side and it's down about 58 steps or something like that. So it's largely unused. There's a, a 
staff parking lot now, but it accesses via this trek up the hill into the building. And as Dwayne indicated, we looked at three or four, four different options, and this one adds on to the east side of the school and connects the upper level uh, to the lower level of the site and makes that transition and efficiently use, utilizes that, that area. Uh, you can see that this adds a bus drop-off lane on site. Now we understand the kids have to come out and go up here somewhere to get on a bus, which is diff difficult in inclement weather and there's some safety issues. This puts that bus drop-off lane very close to the to an entrance to the building. Right now there's the existing gymnasium and there's this really funky addition here for food service like a lift. There's some really strange stairs that go up and down into that gymnasium. Really strange. This takes that off of the building. Uh, there's a future a possibility in the future if we ever needed to add uh, more classrooms or more sections to this building that we could add this on there and we've planned that in this in this the way that the levels would line up uh, right now your existing uh, playground is here and and all of our preconceived notions had had the new addition being up in this area which would have taken out the playground and had a lot of access issues. Well, this addition being here doesn't touch the existing playgrounds. It keeps all that in place. Can I get uh, there's I'm... some existing uh, grading that uh, some hey, ramps and so forth. Did you forth. have a question? Well, it's okay. I just don't, before you go to the next slide, I have a question. But you can finish up what you were saying. Sure. I was just saying there's a few years ago some uh, transition ramps and so forth were made in this area. This can allow all that to remain in place. And actually, Dave will remove uh, several modular units there too, which will increase the playground. Yes, there's monitor existing uh, mobiles there and there that will be removed. Can you just show me again where the bus will come in and where it will exit? It will come down here off of River Street, and it will come in here and pick up students along here and along here, and then it circulates okay. out here. Thank you. We initially had a different idea, but MMS Engineering has taken a look at this, and this is this will work with bus circulation can, and so it forth. It can do that with a full parking lot full of vehicles in there and everything? Yes, it can. Okay, let's go to the next slide. This is the main level of the school. And you may, here's the main entrance, here's where the office is now, and right now we have this main east-west corridor that goes through the whole building. You can see that this solution comes through in an east-west direction and establishes this, this axis, which then goes down in a lobby area down to the lower level within the building. Uh, this, the, there are several existing classrooms here which are largely unchanged. There's a couple of classrooms here that now have toilets in them. So we're proposing to take those toilets out and enlarge these classrooms to the, to the typical size classroom. One of the more interesting ideas of this is to convert your existing gym and stage area to kindergarten and preschool rooms. And we would do this by filling that existing gymnasium nine feet or something like that with uh, basically styrofoam insulation and casting a new floor on top of that. And so that that would then be able to be accessed via uh, the main circulation. There would still need to be some ramps there, but there would not be, there would be total accessibility. Uh, new preschool and kindergarten, a, a, a unisex toilet down here for convenience to those, and introducing a new um, preschool drop-off area here so the kids could come right in here and access that kindergarten and preschool. Other things that 
we're proposing to do is take out all that really strange uh, multiple bathrooms, little rooms in here and put in uh, uh, a current bathroom configuration with lavatories, wash fountains outside. Another thing we're proposing is to consolidate all the administrative functions in this area. We're proposing a small addition out here to enlarge the principal's office so she no longer has to call over uh, file cabinets in order to get in and out of her, of her room. Uh, a, a new nurse's suite with a toilet, a, uh, a volunteer space right off of the, the main, main lobby, a staff toilet, staff workroom, staff lounge. We really like to put those together so that people can be working here and collaborate with other people that are perhaps taking breaks. Uh, relocating the music room in, into this area. This is now the existing media center. Art room here, which is now downstairs, would, would locate up here. Another classroom. And putting the cafeteria up here on the main level. Kitchen here. Kids could queue up, come in, go through, get their plates, uh, be out here, exit, clean their uh, garbage and so forth. Can, can I ask this a question about? This is the media about, center. Sorry, can I ask a question about that cafeteria? So the cafeteria uh, is the, the purple part up there. We considered uh, opening an operable wall up here between the music room and the cafeteria, but that came out in the latest revision. The answer is purple is cafeteria. Yeah. Um, so yes, if the purple is the cafeteria. Purple is cafeteria. I'm but sorry. that's not where it currently is, right? No. So the down current space. I'm sorry, I'm still here. catching up with a lot of information. It's all new. This is from this line. This yeah. Is yeah. Gym. How many square all feet? Do you know how many square feet the cafeteria is? Uh, it's about 2,500. 2,500. 2,089. Yeah. And does that count the preparation the area there or just the seating area? No. That's the seating area. Okay. The kitchen itself is about 650. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And food delivery is going to come. Mm -hmm. from Food the delivery back, can either level. come on the lower level and come up the elevator and right in, or it can come right in and right in, right in here. The existing cafeteria, Chris, is in the gym. They share the right, space. Right, right. Yeah, he called it the gym. I was going to interrupt and say it's really a cafeteria you're looking at there. But. There's some real tough slopes to get down to that existing yeah. uh, gym. Let's, uh, Let's go on down to the lower level. You need to finish the discussion about the media center. I don't think you got that. Go back up. The media center is right up here up on top of the new addition. Uh, views out to the east and uh, seating area and books, tablets, and a media, uh, media workroom. So the byproduct of that is that concrete floor can then lend itself to the gymnasium making a storm shelter out of that. Hmm. Yeah, very good. And we're thinking the ceiling of that gymnasium, the floor of the media center would be concrete double T's with the topping on it, so it would be soundproof and uh, it would be a, a mostly a storm shelter. So, okay, so here we, now we are down in the lower level. This is that bus drop-off parking lot and we would come into a new vestibule lobby, which we'll see in a minute is a continuation from upstairs. And down here we have our gymnasium, gymnasium storage, uh, gym teacher's office, some more bathrooms uh, down here on this lower level, and before and after school program space with an office, uh, a little kitchenette, a storage room so that would really work nicely with this gymnasium and allow parents to pick them up here uh, very conveniently where people can see what's going on. Uh, the south end of the existing building would stay the way it is now. There's an art room there. We're just calling this a flex classroom. It would not be handicapped accessible, so it would have some limited use in that area. We did. Sh we did propose a new elevator stair down here, but in order to keep the budget as tight as possible, we, uh, we took that area off. But in the main area, there's an elevator. 
Yes, the okay. main L. To if you're coming in at that lower level, there's an elevator that would then take you around. Tell them where it's at. Here's the elevator. I thought the font was too small for me, so you know. <laughs> okay, so let's. Uh, that, that one last thing, Dave. The, yes. the current storage room, the re repurpose of some of that. Yes, there, there's this existing storage room, and we're proposing to put some of the mechanical pumps and so forth for the geothermal system down underneath there. What's the square footage on the gym? 4,200. Uh, 4,200. And, uh, uh, is there any uh, designated special ed rooms? Could you, there are. Uh, could you point those out? Yeah. You go at the back areas. All of the orange spaces are the special education or ESL. Um, currently, the school has one dedicated space, and they find kind of closets here or there everywhere um, to use. So now there are four dedicated spaces. Um, you'll also notice that the, the wall between each of those would be a partition, so it could be expanded into a full-size classroom if that there was ever a large grade coming through um, to provide the space more flexibility. Yeah, one more point of interest that we might have skipped over, but a point, you might point out that preschool room again, mm -hmm. sir. There's a separate entrance there so parents can enter for preschool and kindergarten without going through the school, which is desirable. So just so I don't have to come back, can we go back to the existing? Was it one slide back? So that's what incrementalism looks like, right? That's what pay as you go looks like. You do a little bit at a time, every little bit, make sense of the time, go forward to your current your current design. Dave. Forward. So this is what the facilities master plan looks like. This is what breakthrough looks like. You fundamentally and I, I don't want you know you're gonna have more thunder to come here, but you fundamentally change the whole design of the school in, in a breakthrough way that's really 21st century. So you're going to show more cool stuff. I just had to make that point right out of the gate. So it's a choice. It's a choice. We, the, past is, the past is what you got up there. The past is today. This is what we're offering. And it's a choice on what you want. So with that, I'll let you have a better yeah, show. The other, the other really nice feature, and they pointed out once, but I'll do it again, is there, there's room there for a sixth classroom addition off of that, in, that lower it's level. It's brilliant. I mean, I remember my first visit with Ann. We talked about how much of the uh, land just wasn't usable. I don't know what we were thinking. <laughs> well, we took another look. I don't know what we were thinking. I don't know what we were talking about because you guys have figured it out, so it's brilliant. Steve? First time Steve brought this up, I said, you don't need to sell me. This is brilliant. I mean, it's, it's awesome. So We were excited the day we showed it to Steve. Can I ask a, well, what were the anticipated expenditures in the early planning for a possible land acquisition? Because I know that had been part of our discussions when we developed the facility master plan. What had we been planning well, for the possible land you know, acquisition? At a minimum, we needed to buy two properties. And the assessed value of those two properties is over 200000 apiece. So wow. it could easily have been a half million dollars just to buy the two properties and remove the structures. Would have been even more. So you there found a solution without land acquisition. Right. Exactly. I'm sorry. I just want to follow up on that. My memory of the last time we talked about it in work sessions was that uh, we were saying, well, you wouldn't need the land acquisition to do the work on the building, but that eventually you still want that land. That's correct. And the reason, and the reason we made that comment at the time is because we all anticipated adding the gymnasium and cafeteria on the north okay. end of the building. Uh, and that would displace playground, particularly the hard surface playground. So we felt in order to be to keep it as equitable as possible, we would have to then buy property. Yeah. We just didn't need to have property on day one, but eventually we would. And so that's now, what you're, now you're thinking we don't even eventually we don't need, need it. We don't okay. need one square foot. We've got what we need, and we own it. Okay. Can I have one follow-up question, too? So having seen the plan, is it going to change the capacity number of the building? Uh, I haven't redone that, but it's still a one-section school at this point. It could be made a two-section school very easily. The library, can you bring up the library again? We have some videos and some <laughs> animations. Oh, sweet. Uh, <laughs> there you go. 
So where's where's the library on this one? It's the top. The yellow. So that's on the the east second level up top. That way. Okay. So if we wanted to have summer programming and open the library up. Uh, Well, so you could have it so it's closed off and they just come up the back entrance. Or, yes, the... close these doors right here. Right. Yep. And then you come up come up the back side so the whole building is an opened up, excellent. And there's a restroom that would be... There's some there's four. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And the gymnasium on the first level, or on the bottom level, is very accessible for summer programming and everything that way without... that's. I think that that's... Uh, that's excellent, and that should be something to keep in mind with everything going forward. That you know, many times we're told the drawbacks as we're opening the schools all up in the summertime, and and uh, this is this is looking that way. So, so I feel a lot of them have two really nice videos to show you: interior and exterior. I'll let Kristen run them. This takes you through the existing front entrance off of Teeter's Court, and it focuses on the new spaces. Oh yeah, big difference. So to your right and left here is the existing corridor, the new bathrooms on the right, music room. Uh, Do you want to get to the mic there, Dave? Music room on the down, on, hallway. down that hallway. Going through those double doors that we just talked about that could be closed off. And cafeteria on the left and media center on the right. That brick is the existing exterior wall, if you were to keep that, just kind of an mm -hmm. interesting piece. I don't know about that jigsaw carpeting, though. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> awesome views out of there. Uh, it, that blue thing that you see is a playground design that, that we were given that sort of went up the hill over there, uh, which we've attempted to put in our model, but it doesn't show really yeah. well. MMS came up with a design where we could actually build some slides that go up the side of the hill. The natural lighting is awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, every classroom or special ed um, classroom has natural daylighting, a window in it. Wow. Roofs. Pretty flat, actually, on top. Mm -hmm. There's been a water issue on the side. This will take care of it. I know the one you're talking about. I think so, Ann. Okay. This is that intermediate level where the future addition oh. would tie in. Hmm. Gym there on the right, uh, and before and after school program offices on the left, toilet straight ahead. So, this is your storm shelter as well. Excuse me for interrupting, but mm -hmm. is it just the video where it looks like it's sloping in? Is it just the it's just the video. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. The the ceiling so would be flat. It's it's a standard height, Jim. Yeah. Yep. So there's that playground with some slides going up the side of the hill. And the bus drop off there. There's one more video that's sort of a fly around drone view from the outside. That's that exterior. Bus drop off, approaching the lower level, 
Some of the people are actually walking in the air. I don't know. It's because they're so happy. Uh-huh. We talked about adding a um, playground for the preschool and the kindergarten up on this area since this will be the new early ed area. So be right out the door, the existing doors there so that the little ones don't have to walk too far. So you can see the bump out on the front office here too. Yep, there. And it gets rid of the big unsightly equipment that's sitting out of that corner as well. So that's the existing art room there at the lower level. Exactly. Yep, that's your lecture room. Gets rid of the, the mobile classrooms here and here. So just thinking about the secure entrance of parents, um, if uh, there's not a lot of parking up at the top, Correct. so would there be um, a way to buzz in from the bottom? You'd have a camera or something so that they don't have to walk all the way around to get to the secure entrance in the front? Yes, there could either be, um, I'm sure there would be security at, at both entrances, but the idea typically would be that this would be the bus access. We like to keep buses and cars separate, um, and so that if parents were dropping kids off, they may still go to the Teeter Street entrance, and there is security, and they have to go through kind of the admin area and be buzzed through. Otherwise, after um, school started, and unless it was start of day or end of day, this back door may be closed unless they were expecting a delivery, and of course you have to have a camera and buzz somebody in as well. But the idea would be the main entrance would still be the existing one on Teeter's Court. For daytime. For daytime. Day. Mm -hmm. So before we ask, ask questions, I need to, to, to say we realize that this project is dependent on the bond, but we also realize that we need to have this project designed on the shelf and ready to go next spring if we're going to stay on schedule. So that's why we're bringing it to you now. You're going to see man at the next meeting. You're going to see new, the new Liberty Elementary School in September. So all three of those are bond dependent, but you're going to be seeing those. Uh, currently, this is over budget, and we're working to, to, to get it as tight as we can. We may need to look for some additional funding. I'm just telling you that now. I will provide to you when we bring design development the, a, a breakdown of budget for this project so you'll know what it costs. But I think the architects and, and the design team and, and Lang and Phil have done a great job doing this school. So with that, they can answer any question. How right? far over That's, budget? Yeah, how far? Well, it's, I would say it's as much as 30 or 40 percent. So you're talking uh, oh. yeah. actual dollars, you're saying? We're talking significant dollars. Well, a million, million to two million more than what we have in the budget right now. What's one, budgeted one, for one it now? Two million, so it's a $5 million project. It's a $5 million, five million. Dollar project today. It will be more when, if we follow through with this. I think it's 4.7, isn't it? 4.5 is, is 4. the budget. 4.5. So we don't know what that final dollar is. We need to keep working it. We've been so busy working this design, but we need to refine it, make it better, look at all the materials that we're using and how we're using them. Uh, but I want to be honest with you. I mean, it's, it's not what the budget is, but this is such a radical change and such a radical improvement, a good improvement to this building. It makes it a real school uh, that, was, that we felt was worthwhile to bring it to you. Just, just when you ramp back, right? So it was 4.5, 4.7, somewhere in that range, right? So that's going to come with a new number, but then we'll want to talk a net number. So minus future, ac you know, land acquisition, minus a bunch of things you had to right. move and all other good stuff. We'll do our best to break all that down for you. And then we'll have to reconcile it versus, I mean, the, the plan we've been very fortunate to be, you know, there's other areas we've saved money. So this may be an area we choose to in because of the design and the capability you're bringing to school. Right. You may decide, we may decide to increase the budget, is the way I'd say it, versus going over. It's a choice, right? Do we want to do that or not? Right. Now, do you have an option that's in budget? There's one of the earlier one, two, and three options that with the committee pretty much disregarded. So you're not going to bring back an option that is for We point. certainly can if you want to see one. I'm not advocating that. I think this is the way to go. I think it's worth the investment. I think it can be offset in other areas. I'm not advocating that, but... You need to show that, you know what I mean? Right. If you do 4.5, this is what you get. Sometimes that's helpful. And I'm not saying do any more work. But 4.5, this is what you would have got versus if, let's just say this right. is 6. We can do that. Here's what you get for 6, you know what I mean, just so we have an idea. And if you're setting the school up for the next 50 years, we got to decide, you know, 
is this the right thing to do or not, and how does it fit in the total plan, right? Right. We'll, we'll certainly bring you that option as well. And I bet you in the, the 4.5, you, you didn't have an ability to expand six more classrooms, and there's probably other things you couldn't do, or you know what I mean? So as you put them side by side, we need to understand the pros and the cons of each, and of right. which I think you'll have a number of, I don't want to call them soft pros, but there's going to be a lot of pros to this, right? That's what you're bringing. I don't know how much time you want to spend on this, Chris, but I have a zip drive in my pocket that has those earlier options on it. If well, we don't need to do it tonight. I'm just saying okay. as we make the decision, you know, I'm ready to go all in just because I can see the, you know, the benefit and it's a breakthrough design and it just makes total sense and you'll be able to further utilize it in the future. But again, we'll just need to talk about how do you, how do you fund it? Well, how, what are the options for funding it? What are the options? Well, there's additional sales tax dollars. There's additional pebble dollars that might be available. There's some, there's some options that we those, need to I mean, those dollars technically have already been allocated away mostly, haven't they? You'd have to sort of squeeze something else, right? Well, don't answer the question today. Bring it back. So what are the other options? Yep. I mean, we just saved a million bucks on uh, the bond we just did, right? So you could take the million bucks we just saved in the bond we just did and bam, done. Now is this the choice you want to make? Yeah, I think we need the time, Craig and I do, to really sit down and figure out where it's going to come from and how we can do it. But right. it's, a, it's a worthy project. I get it. You're talking a million in capital. I'm talking a million cash flow over time. You know what I mean? you got to work it out, but there's, there's options. So as a person who will be sitting here um, mm -hmm. after September, um, I'm very concerned if we're one of our first projects is as far over budget. Um, some of those projects that we have listed last on the bond or things that I actually thought should have been first on the bond. So I want to make sure that those projects get done. Tate needs a gym. They have no gym. Alexander needs rooms. They've got trailers. Those things need to be done. Kirkwood needs to be done. Some of those smaller projects, very, very concerned that, that where this is going to lead to is no money for the end. Well, I so, personally could not agree with you more. I don't think we should do this at the sake of another project at all. This you don't needs, think, I'm I don't think this again. project should be funded at the sake of any other project. Yeah, so none, we're of not comments, none of my comments would have eliminated any project on the plan. I think you need to look for ways, synergies, opportunities. We just talked about funding opportunities where we freed up a million dollars. I mean, yeah, we're not, yeah, I, 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 Craig could speak for himself, but I have no desire to, to lessen the funding for any other project or the scope. And I understand that, but okay. we have a, with limits. And if we don't have other funding, I just want to make sure. I, just, I yep. wouldn't feel right tonight if I didn't say right. it. Right, and honestly, and I have to know that that we're not going to cut funding for other projects. The funding really should come from outside the bond. That's the thing I think you need to emphasize the most. When they brought this to me, uh, I did see the earlier plans that showed what we can do within the budget. I do know that the committee spent a lot of time working on it. They came back. This was their preferred plan. Dwayne will tell you that the first thing I said is you can't take a project then that's that's over budget. Uh, and then we sat down with Craig and said, well, if uh, that's what the committee is bringing for us, forward to us, we have a responsibility to bring that forward to you as a board. And then we have a responsibility to look at it and say, uh, is there opportunity inside the current budget if we've got to look at resource reallocation in order to meet the needs brought forward by the committee? That's outside of the funding structure that we put in place because I would agree with you 100%. You want to make sure that you don't have mission creep in there that winds up impacting things that happen two, three, four, five years down the line. So that was a, the fundamental piece of the discussion that we had when they first brought this forward. And again, I apologize. I've got my, uh, I believe, the latest uh, version of the facilities master plan in this binder. And when I go to the Lincoln uh, page, um, we started off with a current budget of uh, four. Four million seven hundred sixty thousand and change, and then down at the very bottom, proposed revised budget of six point one for uh, six million one hundred forty-eight thousand. So, can you please give me what your best guess this is looking at going? What's being presented today? No, you can't. But you're saying it is over what is listed here. Yes, and it could be one to two million. Yes, so it could be eight million. Mm, that'd be on the high side, I think. I really do. Well, one to two million over what this is is eight million. So, and you realize that that, that total budget also includes architectural fees. Uh, it includes 
testing fees, all that are in that budget. So there's also a 5% contingency in there. So the actual hard dollars to build this project is 4.5. See, Dwayne, I said 4.7, man. I was 5%, yeah. I give you it. As Steve suggested, um, I would be interested to see the revised budget within the bond because we've been told many times by you folks that we do not have money outside of the bond. Um, the pebble is spoken for. Um, unless it's not spoken for, then tell us how much is available. So show us where you're going to cut on the bond projects. Um, We're not going to cut on the bond projects. I just said that. We're, we, our intention is to find funds that are available to the district outside of the bond. I hear well, you, but bring, save is not passed. So bring um, back the bring back the funding strategy, right? I, I will tell you, I'm uncomfortable with that. So, so um, just a couple quick things. Uh, and this is this is an important reason why not to to specifically list dollar amounts with the 20 projects that are bond dependent, because when you get down to the creativity and solving the coming up with the answers and the solutions to what we need to provide for our students you know you, you got to look at value added you got to look at things like not doing a half million dollar worth of land acquisition and so on and so forth but the thing i was going to ask was that that the video that you just showed and the slide the the powerpoint presentation are those intellectual properties that could not be shared and made part of our board agenda is that something that we could have that we could have imported into our board into board docs? And the, I guess the, the next question is more for Design Alliance. Yeah, because there are properties. We we oh. work for you, and we're at your disposal. If you want to use them for something, then they're entirely. I mean, a lot of times we don't like to put schematics on, but I think right. that was high enough level. Isn't that a security issue? So you guys can think about it. It's it's just I going do down video. the main hall. I guess so. the, I guess the, where I'm coming from is that when North Liberty that. first imagined the roundabout that's by Liberty High, they you know the put a video out there with a yeah. flyby, and that helped people kind of grasp the concept of definitely the outside well, what, flyby. What what would this look like? Sure. Sure. And so I'm just yeah. curious think, if the, the one, if the flyover the around the outside, you know, something that doesn't show the inside, maybe that's. The way to go. I think you're okay because you're just going down the main hall. And but those plans right there that you're, are on the yeah, they're already, docs. Yeah, those so that's plans just showing are already a 3D there. version of what you have there. We've we've given copies of every meeting of uh, of what we've produced. We just we just have the ability with our with our board agendas to have these things imported into there and archived. Then people can get to them easily. Right. Go it makes so. total sense to me. Right. Dwayne or Anne, I just have a couple of questions. How many special education rooms are there now at Lincoln? One. We currently have one room used for resource which has no ventilation other than when the door is open, and it's one of our hottest rooms. We also utilize another closet for our instructional coach, uh, which will now share with ELL. And then we have our Grantwood AEA folks working out of wherever they can find a spot, um, which sometimes includes where our guidance counselor is, which is in another closet with the only ventilation is when the door is opened. So this would be a vast improvement for us. Okay. I didn't ask, is there, is there geothermal? Mm -hmm. There is geothermal. This is a geothermal project? We haven't decided that yet. That's the way that almost all of our projects ultimately go. Uh, there, there's some issues with that and the existing playgrounds and how you header in the, right. the, you know, it's probably a horizontal field. Is there enough length? And we did Coralville Central project for your district a couple of years ago, and that has a horizontal geothermal field. So that's what we would hope we end up with, but we just don't know for sure. There's there's two parts there's two parts to a geothermal system there's the the heat source and then the delivery and the delivery part we've been using heat pumps so that delivery part would probably be the same because they're simple to maintain you can maintain one room and not take down the whole building so that that part of the system can be used it's the heat source and if there's not adequate uh, ground source heat there are space to do enough it's a function of the length of the wells whether they're horizontal or vertical. 
So if there's not enough there to do that, then we'd have to put in uh, a boiler and a chiller, or a boiler and a cooler, some type of chill device for the, for the for the heat. Sorry. Follow up to that question to you, Anne, is with the population um, boundary changes that are forthcoming, you expect to have more e English language learner students coming to your school, so to have those spaces would be very helpful? Yes, absolutely. We, um, with the attendance rezoning, we should receive the students in the peninsula area, which would include Forest View trailer um, residents there who are a higher ELL population. Yes. Okay. So, just my final thoughts, I guess, uh, after seeing this and once we figure out the budget part of it, I think it's a great uh, investment into this school and anyone to say that if we pass the bond and then do this school that we would close it, I think is kind of crazy because I think this is a great uh, investment for the long term. Yeah, and I just have one question while you're up there by the mic. Um, with the uh, preschool up on the upper deck and the limited parking up there, are you confident with the traffic pattern for that that you know, it could be either managed at the bottom or there would be space enough at the top? We would actually be gaining some parking area in the front um, and perhaps maybe a turnaround area for like a three-point turn. So that would increase accessibility for our building also. And then also when you look at the back area where the BASP is located, it actually provides them a visual to see when parents are coming to that back door and they have a, an area where they can gather where parents can come in for drop off. And you are absolutely right, Phil. This will open our school up for more community use where we can close off the academics part, but it can be open year round for um, facilities use like you imagine it to be. And I think with this plan too, it increases our usability of our school property for our community because we have the potential of having three playground areas now that will be accessible and will meet needs. Um, so for us, it increases our, the entire use of our property there. Thank you. Yeah, my last comment, I'll just say, I've said this many times, doing it right the first time is usually cheaper over time, right? So I think that's what to think for as you come back with the total cost. So. All right, well, thank you for bringing an option that uh, is definitely very exciting and has definitely got us out of the box and uh, is uh, very innovative. So let the debate begin moving forward. So so, so with that, I'd answer any other questions you might have on Appendix 9. Okay, entertain a motion. I move that we approve the Appendix 9 items as presented. Second. For the discussion. Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. All right, thanks. Can, can I just ask a clarification question? So when we just voted, we did not approve this plan, right? Well, it's schematic design, you'd have to... Um, these, this is just a we go through three thought steps. exercise. Well, this is the preliminary design work, but we go through two more steps before it's authorized. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to be sure. Thank yeah. you. All right. Item was withdrawn from consent. Number five. I think was that, was that you, Chris? Yeah, that was me. First of all, uh, just want to apologize. It's, I guess it's probably Matt's item. Maybe it's Diane. Is she here? Uh, for not, I mean, I was it's on the road idea. on a highway driving the entire workday yesterday, the entire workday today, so I couldn't really check in with you about this other than just notify you that I was going to pull it. Um, and the only reason I pulled it is, um, for, well, first of all, my initial question is just, so this, these uh, online textbooks, are they for use this coming year? Yes, they would be, they are an online resource, so not exactly a textbook, but I mean, certainly but, a resource. Well, maybe you could just elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. I mean, there won't be a textbook in addition, will there? Sure. So um, just to kind of give you a little background, this process, the science review process, has been going on for two and a half years. So last year was really the time for the teachers to all get together and look at a variety of curricular materials. So the coordinator, Phil Lala, um, coordinated that and he had various publishers come in and they reviewed textbooks. A lot of discussion among that science group as to do we need a textbook 
or do we need other materials? And this is a group that I would say is one of our more forward-thinking curricular areas um, that have not been dependent on a textbook to identify their curriculum. They really have looked at standards, and now with the Next Generation Science Standards have really looked um, strongly into those. So they've always been a group that um, felt like they didn't use a textbook very much. They really used the standards to design their curriculum. So as they were looking through all the resources, um, Phil really coordinated that well and gave them a variety of options, and we've landed on several different options. So our AP courses, um, AP Chem, AP Bio, they're, they're going with traditional textbooks. Um, our chemistry and physics classes, they're actually going to wait one more year. They feel like they have some more work to do with the um, aligning their core to the next generation science standards. So they wanted to have one more year working on that before they chose their resource. And then this group, um, which would be biology, earth and space science, and physical science, they wanted to use to take advantage of this online resource. And what they decided was that they would, in addition to this resource, they would also have textbooks available in the classroom. So biology and um, physical science, they're going to continue to keep the textbooks that they have been using um, as a, another resource for the classroom. And then Earth and Space, we also ordered an additional, because that's a new course, we ordered an additional textbook that they would have classroom sets of, but not individual student sets. So this resource, um, like I say, it's not, they were excited about it because it's not a textbook that is just put online. It's actually um, designed for interactive, engaging learning for kids. So it has videos, it has labs, it has interactive activities. Um, you can change the reading level of the text. You can change the language that the text is presented in. Um, and it really was just the perfect time that this came about with this committee. And at the same time that we're going one-to-one -one in the high school, they really wanted to take advantage of that. So I guess just trying to kind of envision I mean, I understand during the class there's all kinds of things you can do. Is mm -hmm. the idea, though, I mean, if, if the students have homework, sure. will they be doing it? Well, will they, be, they, they won't can be bringing also, those textbooks home, right? They'll be... So they, so they can. They'll, they'll have classroom sets of textbooks and extras to check out as well. Um, but they will be able to access this resource online from home because they'll have their Chromebooks. I guess what, my, what will be assigned? What type of thing will be assigned? Would it be stuff in the textbooks or stuff just on the, this type of resource or? Knowing the science teachers, it may not even be related to either okay. of those. It's All going right. to be assigned according to whatever the standards are. Um, you know, I guess the only reason I, only, only reason I pulled it, and again, if it's something that uh, basically they're relying on having a week from today, uh, I, mean, I won't vote against it, but uh, it just seems like um, the issue of, you know, it's easy to imagine us kind of just gradually without ever really discussing it leaving the world of books and going to more online materials. And, you know, I brought that up when we were talking about the one-to-one -one issue a few months ago. And, uh, you know, I was reassured that, no, that wasn't where it was going to go. But then, the, you know, <laughs> right away we see this. Uh, and it just seemed to me at some point there ought to be some discussion of that at the board table, not necessarily at the meeting, um, at a work session, uh, about whether that's, the direction we want to go or whether we want to put some brakes on that or not um, so but again I mean if it's something you're counting on having next week it's I'll say two things we did put in place um, we could have gone with a one-year subscription a three-year or the full eight-year which mm -hmm. is our traditional um, curriculum review cycle we decided to go with three because we didn't want to make that eight-year commitment but we wanted to give it enough time to really try it and see if it was a, a resource that we thought was going to meet the needs of our kids so we had a lot of conversation about what the length of that contract should be so that's why you see a three-year one here and then we're also they're throwing in which is really nice eight full days of professional development um, that's a twenty thousand um, dollar add end that they aren't charging us for and that professional development isn't even as much how to use that resource, but it's really about how to create an engaging classroom that utilizes technology to advance the curriculum. So I think that's going to be fabulous professional development for our teachers as well. I mean, I think one of the things people might be completely not to worry about, but you know, you could imagine, well, we're not going to dissect the frog anymore. We're just going to dissected the electronic frog or something, you know, I mean, at some point, I think we'd want to at least be careful about what is being replaced 
by sure, the only sure, but, but I'll just throw it out there and people can take yeah, it. Yeah, but through it. a textbook, you're not dissecting a frog either. And, and this is our science okay. curriculum is a, a subject that we have from kindergarten. We are kit-based. I mean, we are hands-on, we are activity-based, and this is a curriculum that has really put value in that. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, there might still be hands-on frog dissection, but certainly we could also then review it in the online format as well. So it um, just opens up more opportunities for our students. So, Dan, I had this theme last week, but so if this fails, we're planning to use this like now, right? Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. So, yeah. Right, if, if it fails, then, you know, we go back to the old textbooks that we have. Right now. But, yes, but we, we are hoping, and, and um, we had wanted to get this on the agenda earlier, but it's, this is when it is. Yeah, I just have a question. As far as the cost, mm -hmm. as opposed to a textbook, mm -hmm. uh, how does this... Um, you know, you, you get a textbook, and the textbook is in the curriculum for how long? Right. So textbook. No, no I'm just curious. First, that's one part of the question is mm -hmm. how long do normally our, uh, we keep a, a textbook in, like, our science curriculum? Yep, normally eight years. Eight years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how does this compare to the three-year cost of textbooks? Sure. So most textbooks run about $120 a student. So you see this is 34 So if you multiply that even by three years, you're going to be right about 100. So it's going to be very comparable. Um, and then we know that if we actually, if we tell them by the end of this year that we want to extend it the eight years, we're going to get a price cut on that too. All right. I have okay. Okay. One more. Uh, you, you mentioned the languages. How many, what are there languages that would be uh, is it Swahili, French, Spanish? Sure, What's yep, I don't have the answer to that. I just know in talking with Phil that that was one element they were excited about as well, that um, it could be read in different languages, but I don't know for sure which ones. Yeah, and with Chris, I, I too want to make sure that we maintain actual dissection of frogs too. And You can't short out a textbook with <laughs> frog guts. Entertain a motion? I move we approve the Discovery Education Science textbook contract. Second. For the discussion, Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thanks, Kim. Number 12, Phil? Yes, uh, and this one, uh, I, when I saw it, I had a question about the fact that the, uh, uh, the donations were currently being administered by the foundation. Uh, when I talked with uh, Mitch uh, before the meeting, uh, he told me that uh, West Eye had raised $20,000 for this and that uh, they plan on raising the uh, funds for the whole project. So. Okay, entertain a motion. Okay. Yes, uh, I, I uh, move that we approve um, professional services for West High Tennis Courts Observation Deck. Second. Second. For the discussion, Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thanks Kim. 15 Chris. Okay well we're just going back to this one from last time. Um, you know I hear what people are saying about the building right now. There is a temporary problem that needs to be addressed. Um, I don't object to addressing that in this fashion. I do object to considering that building to now be able to hold and I'm not sure what the answer is after this, whether this is changing the capacity or number or not, because I asked. Um, I got one answer before the previous meeting. It sounded like Lori got a different answer tonight. Either way, I mean, I was looking at the, when we were took, talking about Lincoln, which is gonna have the 2,589 square foot cafeteria. And if, if I'm right, the cafeteria at Penn is 2,269 square feet, even though there might be two or three times as many students there. Um, so, you know, it, you know, do whatever you have to do to find rooms for these students this year, but uh, I, I would object to changing the 
the, what we consider the number of students that building should properly hold just because we've added these two classrooms to it. Uh, last year or the year before, whatever, uh, we, we had to carve additional classrooms out of Alexander, out of the library space. Uh, when that happened, uh, we didn't suddenly consider Alexander to be able to hold 25 more students. It was considered to be a temporary solution that was hopefully something that would be rectified eventually. Uh, with the Penn building, uh, again, I don't know how we can talk about putting 600 and, what is it, uh, 50, 60, 70 students in that building and calling that the capacity of the building. Um, and what's going to happen or what could happen is uh, we all know that that area is the one area that probably the bond is not, is underbuilding for because the, the enrollment projections there are really inadequate. And uh, if we start calling that a 680 or whatever kid building, it's just a recipe for playing catch up up there uh, with, with capacity. Uh, really shouldn't be holding that many students. So I guess what I would like to see as an outcome is can we, can we agree to do this without changing the capacity number of the building? You gonna make a motion? Well, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> uh, well, I would move that we approve what, well, I don't know what number it is. Was well, uh, 15, but the pen was 15. Pen. Um, so I'm trying to get it up on my screen and it's acting a little slow. That we approve this project to add rooms to pen, uh, but that it not be considered uh, a, any kind of increase in the capacity of the building um, and that, the, that any future increase in what we consider the capacity number would need separate approval by the board. Second. All right, for the discussion. I yeah. have a, yeah, a few things I'd like to say. Um, so is McCullis Lucina at the Penn campus doing work right now? Oh, come on. They're, they're, actually, they're actually there doing a little bit of demolition work for us. And we have one gentleman who's been there supervising part-time for McCullis Lucina. So if this is approved, approved tonight, do they get paid? Well, I think we're obliged to pay them, sure, for the That's time. Not, we're obliged to pay them for the time they have in the project. They've performed the work, so I guess they're at risk, technically. Uh, I would hope that the district would do the right thing by them. Okay. Um, the memo states that the funding source is Pebble, um, but with some of the work being done by general uh, or by our own staff, is any of that funding coming from the general fund? Well, their salaries do. Our carpenters are working there, our plumbers are there, our electricians are there, and our painters are there. So they're all funded by the general fund. And is there a cost that we've put on this project? No, just the materials that we use. When we, do, when we use our own labor, we don't, we don't reassign those numbers to another funding stream that I'm aware of, let's correct that. But we do charge you know, paint, drywall, studs, those kind of things. So can you give me a ballpark? Of the total cost of that project, that with, income with the McComas Lucina edition, uh, I'd have to get their invoice, and I don't have that. So I, I mean, I can get it for you the next day or so, but don't have it with me. Okay, I'd like to know um, what what we expect the cost to be. Sure. Um, because that's directly related to some other comments that I have. Um, so I had asked what the capacity was going to be after this expansion, and Steve got back to me just right before the meeting, said that there would only be 25 students added. Um, and I, I'm trying to understand that because uh, prior emails stated that there would be two small classrooms added plus two oversized classrooms added. And I understand that um, one of those is coming out of a temporary. Um, so I, I understand that. But um, it feels to me like 25 students is a low estimate yeah. of yeah. what will be added to that building. Part of that was a correction that Steve and I realized this afternoon that in the capacity as it exists, there is a classroom that's currently being used for preschool. Preschool is not in our capacity, but we're gonna add a new preschool room, which frees up a room that's already in the capacity, which is in the north wing of the building. So it's already in the number. The new capacity technically would be moving the music room 
to the gymnasium and, and then freeing up that room as a general ed classroom. So that's really the only room that adds capacity to the building. Okay, yeah, so you, but, but you said preschool is not included. Preschool numbers are not included in capacity numbers anywhere in the district. I went back and checked today. Okay, what but when saying? you turn it into a non-preschool room, then we've added capacity. Right. So what he explained to me was, so we count uh, capacity in a building K-6, uh, and in the previous count that was delivered to us, it actually included the uh, pre-K when it calculated the capacity. Oh, I see, for, erroneously. Right, for, right, for yeah. Penn. So then when we're going through, and I was trying to do the math with you this afternoon and things weren't adding up, it's because that preschool room that's currently in there is counted in the capacity for Penn. So uh, when we move the preschool room, while technically it frees that up, we already had that capacity double counted, if you will. Uh, but the mu music room does add capacity, so to, to Chris's point. I think one of the differences with Penn that uh, is perhaps different from Alexander, the example you used there is, uh, you remember when we built Alexander, we created some flexible space at the end of those hallways, uh, and so we were able to enclose that. Now we can use that as classroom space, uh, but uh, it isn't permanent. We can take those walls out. Uh, that wasn't a luxury that we had in terms of building, you know, just enclosing one wall at the end of the hallway to make the temporary classroom space. Uh, at uh, at Penn, and so that's uh, probably the major difference between uh, the two schools, and it's really based on the logistics inside the school. And at the last meeting, Director Levy asked, and I said an argument could be made to add 50, but that's before we really thought, thought through the preschool scenario. So, okay. so um, I have some other comments that I'd just like to make. First and foremost, I, I want to say that I found the decision-making process on this agenda item to be highly, highly frustrating on multiple levels. Um, we're at a difficult spot right now. We have students coming in a week. We have a project halfway done. We have the contractors on site doing work that has not been approved um, by the board. Um, the gym space is now no longer usable in its current state. Um, teachers have rooms that they are expecting, um, and now the board's really placed in an awkward situation. Um, the first that I knew about this project was on July 25th, or prior to July 25th when the board packet came out. I, I had no awareness that there was any kind of project going on. Um, the reason I voted no, which I didn't go into at the last meeting, was because this project did not go through the facilities master plan review process, and the, review, the approval was being asked for in the form of a consent agenda item, and I felt that that was inappropriate to ensure that there was full vetting and community input on this item. Um, of adding four classrooms, which seems to me, in, to, in my opinion, to be a significant addition, um, even though it's a renovation. Um, so my vote was reflective of the disagreement with the process, not with the project itself. Um, at the time, I had no awareness that this project actually had been started. It was already halfway done. Um, I guess what, I wasn't aware that that was how we did things. Um, I've received emails from people on both sides of the issue, um, however, one thing that's been consistent in all of the, nearly all of the emails is that uh, uh, they do not, do not want Penn to be, have their uh, capacity increased at all. Um, the, uh, if this had been brought to the board when we were reviewing the master facilities master plan, um, this expansion, when, when we were reviewing this in January and prior to that, this expansion could have been fully explored in regards to how it will affect the permanent capacity of the building and whether or not the community supports making this a bigger building. Um, during our last review, we talked about um, the common spaces in, in several of our secondary buildings and uh, where we were adding classrooms, and we talked about whether the common spaces um, supported the number of students that were going to be added, um, and if it was determined that the common spaces were not big enough, we made a plan for how we were going to deal with that. However, this was not on that discussion, so we've not had that discussion about this situation, and I, I wish we had. I wish that this had come up in January and we had had that discussion, because um, I feel like that's missing. Can I respond um, because, to that? Uh, th because it wasn't applied to this, I, I will say, I presently don't have enough information to say whether I personally agree with these modifications or not. Um, Though thousands of hours, we've been told many times, have been put into the FMP decisions affecting other schools, this expansion at Penn um, hasn't been discussed at one board work session, hasn't been discussed at any community listening posts, and um, until that happens, I, I can't form an opinion on whether I think it should be um, proceeding or not. Um, 
so again, I, I wish that this had been known to the board when we were um, talking about revising the FMP earlier. Um, however, because Penn is now sitting with a project halfway done, we have contractors on site that deserve to be paid. We have teachers that have been promised new rooms. We have students coming. I feel like it would penalize the contractors, the teachers, and the students if we didn't approve the payment. Um, because I don't want to improve, I, I don't want to penalize the contractors, the teachers, or the students. I will, I will vote affirmatively. However, um, I, I just want to say again, I'm very, very frustrated um, that uh, this came to us the end of July when the progress had already been, the, the project had already been started. In the future, I would like information to be given to the board prior to the start of projects. Um, when there's a four classroom addition, I perceive that as something that rises to the level that I would like to have board awareness and um, I feel like the community deserves to have input on that. Um, and uh, so I, I hope that in the future we can, um, we can talk about these things before they get started. So I'd like to respond to that. Okay. And I don't disagree with you. And I'll accept whatever responsibility there is for the project and my doings in getting the project started. I'm, I've been around long enough to know what, what processes need to be done. Uh, but I would say that there's no way in January or even in May that we knew we were going to do this project. This is a direct result of some additional last-minute additions at other projects. We had to move a modular classroom unit, which dictated that this project be done. Uh, so it's a direct result of other actions in other parts of the district. Uh, we've, and we also have done many, many projects since I've been here that we don't bring them all to the board. We, we did a, a classroom this summer at Twain because we needed a, another classroom. So we built one at Twain in the media center. Uh, we're doing a converting a classroom at Hills to a music room, a computer lab to a music room. Last summer we did Alexander. There are many, many projects that we do on a last minute basis because we know the kids are coming. So I do feel a sense of responsibility that if I need to create space, I need to get it done. So I apologize if you feel that way. Uh, I'll accept that, but I also know that when I'm posed the task to get a room ready, that I will do what I have to do to get it ready so kids have a place to be educated. And the projections that we were given in January or November, I guess I'm not sure of the date on it, um, when we got the Dijon Rector report, um, had um, Penn this coming year, starting in a week, at being at 671 students. So. I don't know whose oversight it was that we didn't discuss that at the FMP discussion, but I, I think going forward we should look at those numbers at the elementary level and we should be talking about that because 671 students is more than I think a lot of people would like to see in that building. Yeah. Fair enough. I'm just so. a facility guy. i got to get the space ready. So. Well, when, and the, the, the motion was brought to us at some point to move the temporaries. At that point? Maybe we could have been alerted to the There were unintended consequences that. when we did that. Well, I would have liked to know those when I yeah. voted on that. Yeah, I just have a couple of things, and I don't, I'm not going to plow the same ground that Lori did. I agree with her fully. Um, uh, I do have problems with voting on things we don't know the cost of. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, if it's 10000 20000 30000 something like that, I, I, I feel it's for us to do our fiduciary responsibility. Mm -hmm. We should know before we do those things. Um, also, at the, at the last meeting, uh, I brought up the fact I, you know, if you're utilizing your own staff now, and I agree fully that if you knew in May, and I, we've kind of gotten into this too before on some of these hard surface projects when we get a big dump of a lot of projects and things, boy, don't hesitate just to tell us this is in the pipeline. This, this is coming forward. And uh, at least it puts it on our radar. And if we ignore it, it's on us. But if we, you know, get these things, I feel, you know, that, uh, you know, we're being forced into a decision uh, on this. And, and utilizing our own staff, great. Uh, that I would have liked to have had a cost of, you know, what the outside work is going to do. I also have a problem with when someone in the community tells me that, in, that a contractor that we voted not to do work on is at a school doing work and I drive up there and I see two of their vehicles there and I'm like does what we vote on have any merit at all and uh, 
like I say, that's that that's that's where I'm that's where I'm coming from on this. Now, you know, I understand uh, the need and that, but uh, boy, there's just a lot of things that we're that's getting ram rod ramrodded through here, and uh, every machine shop uh, has a little sign on the back of the wall and says, "Lack of planning on your part does not constitute a rush on our part." And uh, uh, I, I just you know, in the future, I think we've we've, we've got to uh, get the communications better that way. What, what well, I I'm not I'm not going to sit here and defend everything that we do. I know that we do a pretty darn good job of bringing projects to you. If you if you look at every monthly agenda in the last four and a half years, I've loaded you up with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of projects. This was a last, truly a last minute thing. So I need to say one thing: the reason that we that I brought you the McComas Lucina price list is because it's very detailed. It's very broke down by carpenters, laborers, supervisory, supervisory issues. And in my previous life, I had twice as many craftsmen as that here, and it still wasn't enough. There are times when our own craftsmen cannot keep up. So it's a good idea to have an agreement with a reputable contractor that can provide you with adequate, qualified labor at a predetermined rate. That's how this, that's how this whole discussion with Penn started. I didn't share all that with you, but we need to do the same thing with the plumbing contractor, mechanical contractor, so we have backup personnel to get these small projects done. So this is a small project. Uh, again, I'll apologize for this one, but I'm not going to apologize for what we've done in this, in this facility management department at all. Dwayne, I just want to circle back to one thing. How, what's the anticipated total cost of the project? Yeah, and I, I don't have that with me. I'll have to bring okay. it to you. Um, I, I just, you know, I always, I'm a policy guy. I just go back to the policy. And Superintendent Direction 3D4 says that superintendent shall provide notice to the board in advance of general fund, pebble, or save fund non-contractual expenditures equal to or greater than $100,000. Is this over $100,000 in your, in your estimation? No. There you go, then. We followed our own policies. Right? Do we have I a hope policy so. about changing the, the capacity rating of a building, though, through the consent calendar? Uh, no. No. There isn't. I've been through every policy for the last four years. So it seems to me that's the takeaway from this. Would be if something's going to change I'm the sorry, Chris. capacity I mean, rating, maybe that needs discussion beyond just consent calendar. You can talk to policy going forward, but I mean. And, but, and for me, it's not a policy thing. It's, it's a, a It's a, it's a um, courtesy mm -hmm. to the community. Uh, it's a, it's a, a it's a way to um, be fair in, in how we make our decisions. It's an issue okay. it's both. Thank you. Thank you. It's Maybe uh, if I could just share a little bit uh, in terms of, of some other issues that, that I think had bearing on this. So uh, Amy and I uh, at elementary, Matt and I at secondary, we sit down in the spring and we cast forward so that we have a pretty good idea of what we think we have in terms of uh, uh, at the elementary level, we look at it by grade level uh, by uh, uh, school so that we have a pretty good idea of what the sections look like next year. We do the roll up on there. We want to make sure that if there are uh, transitions that need to be made for staff that we are uh, working with our staff. If we know that there's got to be a restriction, we want to give people the opportunity to do a voluntary transfer that fits for them. And so it's a, uh, for us, it's a staffing issue that we do in the spring. We want to give the principals an idea how many sections do we think you're going to have next year. Um, and I'll tell you that uh, when we sat down and, and we looked at where we thought Penn was going to be this year, Year, it was about 30 students fewer than it is today. Uh, and so when we looked at the RAM and we looked at what we knew were going to be uh, pressure points in the district, uh, we directed uh, Duane to move the, uh, the portable that was at Penn uh, because we knew based on the numbers that we had, the concrete numbers on hand, that, that we were going to need that, that portable. And so we authorized uh, Duane to go ahead and move that. He went ahead and moved it. Uh, and then we wound up with uh, a challenge in, in more students than uh, we anticipated uh, based on the staffing last year. I know uh, Director Liebig suggested uh, earlier, and I, I would agree with you, that when you have those kinds of, of uh, fluctuations, that, that uh, temporary uh, capacity is often the best way to go. Uh, and when we talked about that and when I brought that to Duane, uh, when I talked to Craig, uh, because we didn't have uh, any additional portable units in the district to move, which is usually our cheapest way to do it, uh, Craig came back and said, all right, we've got to acquire a portable. We've got to put it on site. This is what the cost is going to be. 
At that point in time, Dwayne came in and said, let me talk to the staff uh, out at Penn. I think I've got a more creative solution to it. Uh, and this was late in the process, but uh, I'd validate everything you said. I think I've hopefully taken some good notes uh, based on, on your input. Um, I think we can improve our process, both from a transparency standpoint. Uh, I, I know, I think we've still got a couple of folks from Penn left, but uh, you know they were with us from the beginning of the journey when we had that conversation. Uh, and certainly, Christy is, is a, an expert on what happens at Penn, and to have her come in and share some of that with you, I think really helps you in terms of making your decisions. We want to give you as much information as you can so that you can make good decisions. We want to make sure that the staff and the students uh, have an opportunity, if appropriate, to provide input. As you said earlier, we want to make sure that the, the community understands it. Chris, I fully understand where you're coming from in terms of the capacity issues, and, and Lori, I've heard from probably many of the same parents that you have that uh, they're worried about, uh, and several of them, they probably expressed it to you too, they're concerned about, okay, so if the bond doesn't pass, do we suddenly have an 800 student elementary school was what uh, one of the, the parents that talked to me yesterday uh, shared, and, and so I understand where that apprehension comes from, and, and I think there are opportunities for us. Uh, to work uh, more efficiently in order to provide you information that hopefully takes away that apprehension from the general public and also gives you the information you need to make good decisions. Thank you. All right, I feel like we're about ready to vote for the discussion. Um, well, it, it, it does seem a little strange that the work continued after the mo proposal did not pass. I was going to say if you have anything to yeah. add to that. Well, I, the final result, I guess. My feeling after the last meeting is what didn't get passed or what got passed. It was a capacity issue. The, the issue of the contract never got addressed. So I still have the challenge of having spaces ready for students. Uh, no place to put them. So we proceeded very slowly and very judiciously, tried not to spend any more money than we needed to until we actually had this discussion because we still need to finish the space. And part of the other process, and, and I don't, uh, didn't hear Dwayne explain this earlier, was as soon as the board uh, made that decision, the first thing I did was I directed Dwayne to bring the uh, North Liberty uh, inspector uh, into the building and ask uh, what was going to be our occupancy, uh, what was going to be our issue with that, and if there were any things that needed to be completed based on that board decision in order to ensure that we had occupancy on August 23rd. There were a couple things that the building inspector indicated to Dwayne that needed to be done. Uh, and so I said, those things have to happen so that we have uh, access to the second grade classroom so that we can make sure that those students uh, have that, uh, uh, those instructional spaces available to them. I also told Dwayne, if our uh, staff, uh, back to Phil's earlier comment, if our staff can continue uh, to work on the project uh, inside uh, that scope to make sure that, again, uh, where possible, uh, we've got access to the greatest amount of instructional space to continue doing that so that we were ready for August 23rd. I, I just would like some clarification, Julian, mm -hmm. on what you just said, that since the discussion, the motion failed. Now, why it failed is, to me, of no significance if the motion fails and the motion was to hire the contractor, your decision to, to get them to come in in direct opposition mm -hmm. to what had been voted on uh, I don't know how you go with your just trying to justify it, but we made a decision, whether you think it was right or wrong, and went ahead and disregarded what we had just done. I've already apologized. I'm not going to do it again, Phil. Well, no, no, I, I understand, but I, I, I hope that... I understand. You, you understand what, oh, absolutely. What, what you just explained kind of even left me with more questions. I understand fully. I also understand what I had to get done. Okay, but it's right, the further. principle that we're wondering about. I mean, last year we had a hearing about an employee who was terminated because, because she didn't just follow the chain of motion. command, and she was insubordinate. And with that, um, so we just want to make sure that the, you know, if there's, what's the principle about what you can do after the board has already voted something down? All right, I think we've asked and answered the question. With that, Kim, ready to vote? I didn't get a statement of the principle, but Kim. Fine. Uh, Kim, could you just please uh, reread the yep, motion? I have uh, approved consent agenda item 15 to add rooms to pen, but it not be considered any kind of increase of building capacity, and any future capacity increase would be considered by the board. Online voting is open. <coughs> Mm 
Mine's not popping up again, but I'm voting yay again. Okay. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with directors Liebig, Rotland, Kirschling, Lynch, and Ressler voting yay and director Hemingway voting nay. Thanks, Kim. 16, 17, 18 together, Phil? Yes. Uh, this is on the uh, change orders on our storage buildings. And uh, it's kind of uh, appropriate since we're talking about outside the bond uh, areas to save money. Um, these uh, storage buildings are uh, beautiful brick structures, but uh, whatever's stored in them couldn't tell the difference between that or a uh, uh, sheet metal building or a shipping container. And uh, I think we could, we could provide appropriate, desirable storage without spending a total of $284,000 uh, on these. Um, sometimes it's specifications and uh, uh, definition of an elephant is a mouse made to specifications that are excessive. I, uh, I uh, will not vote for this. Can you a motion? Are, are these all three together then, Phil, or are you doing them separate? All three together? Together. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, I move we approve uh, items number four, five, and six that were withdrawn from the consent agenda. Second. For the discussion. Well, can we hear from, from Dwayne in response to Phil? You may recall that we, many, many months ago, we, we took bids on these projects and they exceeded $400,000 and we rejected them. We went back and redesigned these projects. And the reason we undertook the projects in the first place is because the city of North Liberty asked us to get the three temporary storage buildings off the parking lot of North Central. There are three temporary buildings sitting on that lot that are very unsightly. So we agreed to build a building and at the same time found it would be beneficial to come up with a standard standardized building that we could do. We used the one at Garner as a template. It's a masonry building. It, and with a wood structure roof, which these are, uh, we've asphalt shingles don't seem to last too long in, in the life of a school district. So the architect has recommended that we put a, a standing seam uh, metal roof on these on these buildings uh, to extend the life of them. So that's the recommendation from the architect. Uh, I have done a lot of buildings with steel roof. Some of them been there for four years, and they're still there. So I know they last. Uh, and these are more than just a garden variety storage shed. They're more than just a residential garage. They are substantial buildings, but in the life of the school district, I think these buildings will last 50 years with value added in that regard. So we won't have to be rebuilding them. We won't have to be moving them around. Uh, they'll serve a purpose. For the discussion, Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with directors Liebig, Rotland, Kirschling, Lynch, and Ressler voting yay and director Hemingway voting nay. Thanks, Kim. All right, on to agenda setting the 22nd. Now, recall a couple things. One is since we moved the meeting back a week, we're releasing the board packet tomorrow. That's correct. So, and we're in the week before school. So I'm just going to suggest we allow the agenda to stand as is and and uh, have it as presented. Yeah. Can I put a parking lot thing on or two? Sure. Okay. Um, I'd like to have, a, and this can be whenever, a discussion on outside grounds usage after school hours. And there was a incident on the city high soccer field that uh, um, we need to, I, I, I would like to have a discussion on as far as, you know, use of school grounds Got it. during non-school hours, that type of a thing. Probably how, a good work session. Be, you know, sure, we, how, we, how, however it does, but uh, I, I did have a conversation with Terry Coleman about it and and everything that way, and I think that it'd be important to know. We have a usage policy for our buildings and things, so I'd just be interested. To and see. Just, just so you know, we looked at that three, three and a half years ago, so there's probably a little history there you can take into the conversation. Sure. Yep. Sure, and I'd also like to put a parking lot on there for uh, 
uh, again, I'm going to bring up the discussion of uh, the superintendent's uh, degree, and I think that that should be uh, public. I don't think it should be in private, and uh, that can be put on an agenda when appropriate. All right. Anything else? Uh, under teaching seconds? and learning, the special education update. I'm wondering if it could, in, if it's meant to be limited to those three items, or if it could include an update on the. Um, ruling that we got about the seclusion boxes and how we're progressing with that as well. I think some of that will be included in there because part of that is the work that we're doing with the Iowa Department of Education, so I will make sure that they're aware of that. Uh, also, just as a, an FYI on, on two of the items, uh, first of all, for the special ed uh, one, we also added the district developed service plan. Uh, at the end, that's a required action item. It's part of our work with uh, the AEA and the state. And then uh, I, I talked to uh, President Lynch about this. Uh, Kim Colvin and I will work with the AEA to make sure that we have the appropriate uh, uh, AEA director district uh, information posted. They've sent us numerous conflicting emails, and so uh, we are going to reconfirm with them uh, what exactly is supposed to be on there as they attempt to resolve their director issues. That's a good question. I think that's. I think that's resolved. We don't need an item, but it's very confusing. Chris and I had a... Uh, it would be a very short administrative item. Yeah, we were both confused about that, but we'll make sure that we get the right information on there. Part of it is that uh, the director districts, which part of them actually cover Iowa City and don't. So we'll make sure that we have the appropriate information on there for you. It may look a little different than this. Okay. Uh, and we'll only put it on if we absolutely have to do something. Correct. Otherwise, we're not going to... Correct. Yeah. Dwayne, you mentioned um, during the discussion tonight about Lincoln, you mentioned that... Uh, we'd have some idea of what was going to, what the plans would, might look like for man. When is that anticipated? You see, I think Actually, I, I posted an agenda item today for next week's meeting to do a schematic design on man next for week. For next week's meeting? Yes, sir. Okay. Very cool. Exciting. And for, it's and it's, it's a nice plan. Since the agenda's coming out, we're back to, we're full week now, so if we yeah. want to look at those on Friday, we can. Yeah. All right, with that, I entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.